Well, good evening. Good to see everybody here tonight. Looking forward to a good midweek service. Thanks for being in church. And take your Bible this evening, if you would, please, and go to Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10. We have actually three apostles we'll cover this evening. The You could call them 9, 10, and 11. Uh, the twelfth will be Judas Iscariot, and uh, we'll cover him in a couple Wednesday nights from now. And tonight we'll look at James, the son of Alphaeus. We'll look at Judas of James, or sometimes called Thaddeus, and sometimes called Lebius, and then Simon the Zealot. We'll put all three, three of these together in our lesson for tonight, all right? <clears throat> Matthew 10, verse 1, when he had called unto him, his twelve disciples, he gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. Now the names of the twelve apostles are these, the first Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew his brother, James the son of Zebedee, and John his brother, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas, Matthew the publican, James the son of Alphaeus, and Lebius, whose surname was Thaddeus, Simon the Canaanite, and Judas Iscariot, who also betrayed him. Father, I pray that uh, you'll add your blessing to the reading of the Scripture tonight and the other Scriptures that we'll look at this evening. And I pray, Lord, that you would help us this evening as we study the lives of these three men. Not a lot of Scripture given and not a lot of information into their lives. But what we do have, Lord, I pray that it would help us this evening. These men were, they really are heroes of the faith to us. Lord, they weren't, never thought themselves to be so, and yet, Lord, they were tremendous men chosen by you, and they left all and followed you. So, Lord, I pray you'd help us to glean some things from their lives that will make us more effective followers of Jesus Christ. And it's in his name we ask it. Amen. Now, we're coming to three of the final four of the apostles. And they're always uh, the final four names of three of the final four names on any list of the apostles that you have uh, given in Scripture. Uh, James the son of Alphaeus. We have uh, uh, Lebius, who was Judas of James, or uh, we'll say more about that. Lebius, who they surnamed. What's surname? Nickname. They nicknamed him Thaddeus. And then uh, we have Simon the Canaanite, or Simon the Zealot, as he's often called. All right? Now, let's talk, first of all, we'll take James, the son of Alphaeus, or sometimes in Scripture called James the Less. James the Less. Now he was called the Less to distinguish him from James, the brother of John. James and John, the sons of thunder. Okay, And I don't think he's less because he's less of a man or he's less of a follower. He's either less just to distinguish or maybe he was less because he was younger. And so they called him James the less. He's always ninth on the list of disciples. Now the truth about James is, is this. There's more given in Scripture about his mother than there is about him. And we have more information about his mom than we do about him. She's referred to as Mary, the mother of James. She's one of the women that followed Jesus and ministered to Him. We spoke about that a while back. And uh, she's listed in, in fact, if you have your, if you want to look over there, Luke chapter 8, Luke chapter 8 and verse 3. But verse, verse 2 says, And certain women, which had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities, Mary called Magdalene, out of whom went seven devils, Joanna, the wife of Chusa, Herod's steward, and Susanna, and many others which ministered unto the Lord of their substance. Mary would be included in this group. Now it says they ministered to the Lord 
of their substance. When it, the word ministered means to be a servant. It means to be an attendant. It means to wait on someone. She just was a servant. Not many people want to be a servant. In fact, sometimes when you you'll hear people when they're continually waiting on people or doing something for people, at some point they get they've had enough, they get fed up, so to speak, and they say, What do you think I am? Your slave? <laughs> right? See, nobody who wants to be a servant anyway. And, and Mary did. Just, and these women did. They just ministered to the Lord. What a, uh, in other words, she was more interested in service than the spotlight. And that's, by the way, can I, can I say that's the way mothers used to be? Mothers always would put others ahead of themselves. Mothers never said, what about me? When do I get time for me? You never heard old-fashioned mothers talk that way. See, you take the M off mother and what do you have? Others. And that's exactly what mother lived for. She lived for others. Other people, other family, the rest of the family could get new outfits and mother would make do with what she had. Other, she'd make sure that the kids had food and mother would say, well, I'm just not very hungry. She'd make sure everybody else got fed. My, my, uh, I remember my mother-in-law, and uh, she's in heaven now, and uh, how, how fond she was of the burnt toast. Oh, I love the crunchies. Huh? She would always take that. Say, are you kidding me? You know? But uh, that's what mothers do. They take the stuff that no one else wants and they make do. Mary was that way. Mary was a, what a, by the way, what a great example for her son who isn't going to be in the top three. He's not even going to be in the next four. He's always going to be mentioned ninth of the twelve apostles. Okay? He's, he's, uh, he, he says, son, son, follow Jesus. Be loyal to Him. Do what He wants you to do, even though you may be in obscurity. <laughs> even though they're not going to know your names. Oh, uh, James. Oh, not, not you. I mean, John's brother. No, not, not, not James the Less. I don't mean, I don't mean you. I wonder if every time Jesus said, James, and his ears perked up and he realized, oh, he's talking to the other James. Hmm? Wasn't me. Be faithful and lawyer and loyal. In Matthew 28, this is interesting. Uh, let's see. Matthew 28, which is the resurrection. Notice what it says in, in verse 1. Matthew 28, verse 1. In the end of the Sabbath... As it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the what, church? Other Mary to see the sepulcher. You know who that other Mary was? Yeah, that's James's mom. How'd you like to be, go through life being known as the other Mary? Maybe, maybe that helped her son go through life being known as the other James. Her example of continuing to serve and uh, to only be known as the other Mary. It's mentioned the same way in Mark 16.1. And so maybe that helped James to be known as James the Less. Or, or James, the other James. And, and just to serve God even though you're not in the spotlight. Even though you're not as well known as what someone else is. You know, I growing up, my older brother... Uh, was was uh, very good both in baseball and basketball. In fact, he he started varsity in high school as a freshman. Uh, he one time as an eighth grader. My brother's only five foot ten, and uh, as an eighth grader, I don't know if it still holds or not. As an eighth grader in Ohio, uh, he scored sixty six points in a basketball game by himself. 
And, and, and I don't know if that's still a record or not. But you understand, I'm two years behind him. So growing up, who was I? Oh, you're Scott's brother. That's all. I, I think I was in uh, ninth grade till I knew my name was Stan. But uh, it was, uh, you're Scott's brother. And, and that's how you grow up. And, and, and I know a little bit what this guy might have felt like. But what a, what a faithful man. And maybe faithful, by the way, mom and dad, because he had a good example. Mom and dad, set a good example for your children. If you want them to be a servant, be a servant. You be a servant. If you don't want them seeking the spotlight and always wanting attention, don't you seek the spotlight and want attention. Boy, uh, your, your example, children will not be what you say, they will, they will be what you are. No, it's a, you, know, you know what? When you say, now, now do as I say, not as I do, you know what that is? That's called a waste of breath. Okay? Because they aren't going to follow it. Okay? They're going to be what you are. Be a good example. Uh, James's mother was a great example to him. And I think helped him to be faithful to the Lord. Now the second guy we look at, that's all we have on James, the son of Alphaeus, and uh, was his, mainly his mother and the example she was to him. The next is Judas of James. This is the only apostle who has three names. He's called Judas in Luke 6 and Acts 1. He's called Thaddeus in Matthew and in Mark. And he's called Lebius here, surnamed Lebius, or called Lebius, surnamed Thaddeus in Matthew. Thaddeus, that was the nickname they gave him, means one that praises or a man of heart, or a man of heart. In other words, here's a, here's a man that had a, had a tender heart. He had a compassionate heart. He had a, here's a man who seemed to, to have a heartfelt compassion and probably a gentle spirit. Now that's interesting. Because he's hanging around the final three guys who all were associated with what, what group that were called the Zealots. And we'll say more about them in a little bit when we get to Simon. And, and certainly... I, I, you know, zeal is good, and we like fiery preaching. And somebody who, who I like, I like preacher who believes what he's saying, and 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 will get on. We say when someone's excited about God and really, really their heart's really into serving God, we say, man, they're really on fire for God, or they got a lot of zeal for God. And and that's certainly good. But God is maybe telling us that someone who has a compassionate heart and someone who has a a gentle spirit can be a good preacher too. See, don't get caught up like Corinth and get caught up in the style of the preacher. Well, I like Paul. You know, he doesn't mince any words. You know what I mean? Well, I like Apollos. Boy, he's eloquent. Boy, he paints the picture when he preaches. You know? And, and everybody had their favorite of how, and it's favored in their style of preaching. But it doesn't matter what the style is, it matters the content of what they're saying. And ask God to give you a blessing as they speak. So God is putting a sweet spirited, gentle, kind hearted soul like Lebius, who he nicknames, surnames Thaddeus, as one of his twelve. Now, he's the only guy that we have recorded of these three that said anything that's recorded for us in Scripture. And he spoke, he asked a question in John 14. So let's turn over there and look and see what he said. John chapter 14. John 14, as you know, Jesus is preparing His disciples for His departure. He starts out the chapter by telling them not to let their heart be troubled. They believe in God, believe also in Him. He tells them that uh, in His Father's house are many mansions, and He's saying, I'm going to prepare a place for you. 
And he's saying, if I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Remember, we talked about where, the way, where I go, you know, and the way, you know. And Thomas said, wait a minute, we don't know where you're going. <laughs> and we don't know the way. Uh, tell us what that's all about. And we got the great statement from Jesus about I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. And so we get that great statement. And so we still, they're still trying to process all this. And Jesus then lets them know, hey, fellas, I'm leaving you, but I'm sending another one just like me to be not just with you, but to be in you. And he's talking about the Holy Spirit. And he's letting him know. Notice, Verse 17. Well, verse 16. He says, I will pray the Father, and He shall give you another Comforter, that He may abide with you forever. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth Him not, neither knoweth Him, but ye know Him, for He dwelleth with you, and shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless, I will come to you. Yet a little while, and the world seeth me no more. But ye see me, because I live, ye shall also live. At that day ye shall know that I am in the Father, and ye in me, and I in you. And he that hath my commandments, and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him, and will manifest myself to him. Judas saith unto him, not Iscariot. So we know it's not Judas Iscariot, this is Judas of James. It's the only time he speaks in Scripture. And he says, Lord, how is it that thou wilt manifest thyself unto us and not unto the world? Jesus, if you're going to make yourself known, how come we're going to know and the world won't know? Shouldn't, how come we'll get it and we'll understand, and no one else will. The world won't understand. I, he, he, couldn't, he couldn't put that concept together. So Jesus answers him in verse number 23. If Jesus said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. He that loveth me not keepeth not my sayings. And the word which ye hear is not mine, but the Father which sent me. Now these things have I spoken unto you, being yet present with you, but the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things, and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. So Jesus is, is what he's telling what he's telling Judas here is, yeah, I'm talking about spiritual illumination, spiritual understanding, not natural understanding. You will understand who I am because of the Spirit of God. They will not understand because they don't have the Spirit of God. In fact, the natural man receives not the things that be of the Spirit of God, because they're, they're discerned, they're, they're disabled. They're unable to understand because they don't have the Spirit of God. So they cannot understand the things of God. So it's the Spirit of God that, that will reveal those things. You see, Jesus is not revealed to people who do not desire to know Him or obey Him. Jesus is not revealed to people who do not desire to know Him or obey Him. So much false teaching and false doctrine comes from people who want to teach the Bible and preach the Bible and don't know the Christ of the Bible. Because then they don't have any spiritual understanding of the book. God opens the eyes and He opens the understanding of the faithful and obedient believer. When you're faithful to God and you're obedient to Him, notice what Jesus said. He said, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him. And what will happen? We will come unto him and make our abode with him. We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna dwell with that man. 
And he opens up. Who indwells the believer? The Bible says when you receive Christ as our Savior, when we accept Christ as our Savior, then we all are indwelt by the Holy Spirit of God. All right? Holy men of old wrote the Bible as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So the author of the book lives inside of you and me. See? So you don't have to... The, you got... You have just as much opportunity to know the Bible as what the preacher does. You ought to know God's Word. And if you have a question or you don't know, have you asked the Holy Spirit to enlighten you? Have you asked the Holy Spirit to teach you His words? And in a, you know, um, Brother Bowman has written some books. How many books have you written, Brother Bowman? Published nine, Okay. I've got several on my shelf in the office there. You know what's great? If I'm reading a book and I had a question that Brother Bone wrote, you know what I can do? I can go ask the author what he meant by that. And he can tell me. Then, well, here's what I was thinking when I said that. and I can, He can explain it to me. Well, you know what? We have the author living inside of us. And so often, we, we, we just want to ask everybody else what their opinion is instead of saying, Holy Spirit of God... Show me what the Word of God says here. Show me what the Bible means. Let the Spirit of God guide you into all truth. That's why someone who is saved and has the Spirit of God in them and who loves God and wants to keep the Word of God and will give themselves to study, to show themselves to prove unto God, God will show you things out of the Bible that somebody with a Ph.D. may never say. Because it's not about knowledge. It's not about uh, just human knowledge and human understanding. It's about being yielded to the Spirit of God and desiring to know God. And then God reveals Himself to you. And you'll see Christ in the Word of God. You'll see Him revealed to you because of the Spirit of God that dwells in us. And we have that because Judas said, how can that happen? And so he was willing to ask the question, well, let's go to the third guy tonight. The third guy we find is Simon the Zealot. Simon the Zealot or Simon the Canaanite. He's mentioned in 11th on the list in Matthew and Mark and 10th on the list in Luke and in Acts. Now when it means Simon the Canaanite, it doesn't mean he was from Canaan. It's a, the Canaanite is simply the Hebrew word for zealot or zealous. There were four groups in Israel at the time of Christ. Four different groups that people belonged to. Number one were the Pharisees. You're very familiar with them. You see a lot of them in the New Testament, in the Gospels, in the time of Christ. They controlled the religious lives of the Jews. And they were conservatives. Now the name means to separate. And they did from everything, <laughs> uh, anything and everything they could. They, they, didn't just, they didn't just follow the law, they added a bunch of laws to it. And they got very proud, they got very arrogant, very boastful. They wore, uh, many of the Pharisees, the teachers would wear big keys uh, they have a thing around their neck with a big key hanging out, like a skeleton key type thing. You know what it represented? That they held the key to all knowledge. Nothing proud about that, of course. Huh? It's, it's just uh, that was the Pharisees. And the Lord had some pretty scathing remarks for them. The other group, the second group, is the Sadducees. They were elitists. They were more liberal than the Pharisees in their methodology and in their practice and their beliefs. In fact, the Greek culture had spread quite a bit uh, during that time and they embraced some of the culture of the day and brought that into their beliefs and practices. So the Sadducees didn't like the Pharisees and the Pharisees didn't like the Sadducees. If you remember when Paul got arrested and they were, uh, he, he, he realized that half the crowd were Sadducees and half the crowd were Pharisees, and he said, of the resurrection of the dead I'm called in question of. 
Well, the Pharisees said, well, if he believes in the resurrection, he's okay. And the Sadducees didn't believe in the resurrection. They didn't believe in an afterlife. They didn't believe in miracles. And so he split the crowd. Well, that's where the Sadducees were. They, didn't, uh, they were very wealthy, very upper crust, Jewish aristocracy. They didn't believe in miracles. They didn't believe in the afterlife. That's why they were sad, you see. Okay? And uh, the Sadducees. So you have the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and you have another group called the Essens. E-S-S-E-N-E-S. E-S-S-E-N-E-S. The Essens. Who were these people? These were people who were disgusted with the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and they broke off and formed their own church. Formed their own group. Not a church. But formed their own group. They're not mentioned in the Bible because they moved out of Jerusalem and basically they lived as nomads in the desert. They studied the Old Testament law. They were very strict to keep the dietary laws of the Old Testament. And they were committed to celibacy. Those were the essence. The fourth group were the zealots. The zealots. This was the group that Simon belonged to. The historian Josephus, the premier historian of that time, he called them the dagger men. The dagger men. Why? Because they were, they were more than willing to stick a dagger in any Roman they could. Particularly any Roman soldier or any, any Roman politician. And they did. Their motto was, we have no king but God. And they were frequently involved in murders and assassinations of Roman soldiers and officials. In fact, it is believed that Barabbas was one of these zealots. Remember, he was arrested for murder and sedition. They believe he was one of these zealots that got released, and they said, crucify Jesus. What's interesting is, Simon never lost the name Zealot. Now, and by the way, it's interesting to remember, here's a guy who was part of the dagger man that, that uh, was well known, they weren't afraid to stick a knife in somebody. And Jesus calls one of these guys to follow him. And, and at the same time, there's somebody named Matthew or Levi who's been a collector of taxes for the Roman government. Yeah, I, I don't think, I, I doubt they shared the same bunk. But they had to get along. No wonder there were times Jesus said, fellas, they'll all know you're my disciples because you love each other. Okay? That's important. And he, and he mi blended those guys together. But Simon never lost the name Zealot. He's always referred to as that. And I think it's because he wasn't just zealous for the nation and zealous against the Romans. I think when he began to follow Jesus, he was zealous for Jesus. And he had that zeal for God that he had for the nation and his patriotism earlier. Zeal. You know, people get passionate about many things. We have, we have a day where people are pretty passionate about their politics. Probably always have been, but I think it's been ratcheted up to another level in our day. But people all, all have passions about something. Passions about the whales or the spotted owls or the trees or whatever it may be. And people get real passionate about these things. But, but who's passionate about God? Who's, who's zealous for the work of Christ? Who's got to say, you know, William Booth, the founder of the Salvation Army, said some men's passion is for gold, some men's passion is for silver, some men's passion is for, for fame. My passion will be for the souls of men. Boy, who says that anymore? 
Whose passion is it to get the gospel to people? If it doesn't come from us, if it doesn't come from, from Bible-believing Christians, where's it going to come from? Simon had that kind of zeal. What's zeal? Zeal for God. It's a burning desire to please God. What is zeal for God? It's a burning desire to do His will. What is zeal for God? It's a burning desire to give God glory. That's zeal for God. And it is essential for every believer. Look at a couple of scriptures with me. Go to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12 and then uh, Acts chapter 20. Romans 12 and Acts 20. On your way to Romans, stick a finger in Acts 20. And then we'll look at Romans 12 first. In Romans 12, he's after telling us about presenting our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, he kind of is giving us some practical application of that. And he t- says in verse number 8, let love be without dissimulation, hypocrisy if you will. Abhor that which is evil, cleave to that which is good. Be kindly affection one to another with brotherly love and honor, preferring one another. Watch now, not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Fervent in spirit. The word fervent is where we get our word hot or heat. It's boiling. Ever been, you ever been fervent in spirit for the things of God? We're to be fervent in spirit serving the Lord. Listen, half-hearted doesn't go with serving God. We're to love the Lord our God with all our heart. Everything we have. Now, let's look at Acts chapter 20. The Apostle Paul, speaking here to the Ephesian elders, he tells them in verse 22 that now, Acts 20 verse 22, Now behold, I go bound in the Spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there, save that the Holy Ghost witnesseth in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. Now watch it. Listen to this zeal. But none of these things move me. Neither count I my life dear unto myself, that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. They're all trying to tell them, don't go to Jerusalem, Paul. Don't go there. Man, even had a guy say, you're going to get bound there and they're going, to, they're going to arrest you and you're going to be in prison. He said, man, that doesn't move me one bit. That doesn't bother me at all. I'm ready to go and preach the gospel. Boy, I like his zeal. I like his burning desire to do the will of God. Is there something in your heart? Is there something in your life that just burns that you would do something for God with your life? Is there there a desire, a burning passion in your heart to do the will of God for your life? That God would receive glory from my life? That that only one life so soon it will pass and only what's done for Christ will last? I don't know about you. I want to be excited about living for the Lord. I'm excited about being a Christian. I don't want to... "Ah, It's Wednesday. Guess we've got to go to church. Huh? Come on, if we're not there, you know, pastor will call us. Huh? Oh, we ought to have more of a fervor and excitement than that. I, I see people post, you know, on, on social media, oh, only so many days until football. Only so many days till the Buckeyes kick off. Man, they're getting all excited. Wouldn't it be great to see somebody put up there and say, hey, only four more days till Sunday. Huh? Church time. Boy, it would be nice to have somebody get excited about that. 
Well, zeal. Simon the Zealot. Thaddeus and Bartholomew were the first to take the gospel to Armenia. Is Ann in here? Ann's not here. Ann's back there. You. You run with people who on the back row, you end up on the back row. Used to be right up here, right now she's on the back row. But that's another message. We'll wait on that. They were the first to take the gospel to Armenia. Bartholomew is the patron saint of the Armenian Apostolic Church. Did you know that? There's a St. Bartholomew Monastery in southeast Turkey. And there's a St. Thaddeus Monastery in northern Iran. But they were both built in Armenia at the time. Armenia became the first Christian nation in the world in 301 A.D when they proclaimed Christianity would be their national religion. Now, Thaddeus suffered martyrdom around 65 A.D. with Simon the Zealot. Simon, it is reported after Pentecost and the persecution that came and they scattered abroad, went to Egypt, North Africa, Liberia, Spain, and even Britain for a short time. History is divided on how he died. Some say he was crucified. Others say he was sawn in two. But he was a martyr for Christ. You remember, all of the disciples forsook all to follow Christ. Um, look at Luke 18 with me, will you please? Will you turn there? Luke 18. We're almost finished. You can put your seats in the upright position and put your tray tables where they belong. Luke 18, verse number 28. Notice what Peter said. Peter said, Lo, we have left all and followed thee. And he said unto them, Verily I say unto you, there is no man that hath left house, our parents, our brethren, our wife, our children, for the kingdom of God's sake, who shall not receive manifold more in this present time and in the world to come, life everlasting. Their sacrifice really was heroic. And with the exception of Judas Iscariot, they all became very bold and valiant witnesses for Jesus Christ. That's interesting. The Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, they don't portray these guys as heroes. We see, we see some great things and we see some not so great things. We see the, 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 the strengths, but we also see the weaknesses. Their biggest and greatest works took place after Jesus went to heaven. After Pentecost, from Pentecost on. And when the persecution came. Now, wonder why that was. What took place at Pentecost? Yeah, the power of the Holy Spirit came down. And now they're doing what they do. Remember, Jesus' promise was, the Holy Spirit is with you, but He shall be in you. And now that He indwells in you, you've received power. You'll receive power, Jesus said, after the Holy Ghost has come upon you and you'll be witnesses unto Me, both in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and in the uttermost parts of the world. And they saw that take place. And they understood what Jesus meant when He said, the works that I do will you do, and greater works than these will you do, because I go to my Father. And I go to my Father, and the Holy Spirit is coming to dwell in you. And you'll do greater works. We love to quote, uh, um, uh, not him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all we ask or think. But that verse doesn't end there. It's according 
to the power that worketh where? In us. In you. That's the power of the Holy Spirit in us. God can do... Hey, these men did amazing things. They really did. Strong and courageous. Bold to preach the gospel. But so can you. The same Holy Spirit that is in them is in you. The same Holy Spirit that is in them is in me. What can we take away from these men? I think, obviously, the power of the Spirit. But I want you to go to John 6 with me, will you? John 6. We'll just look at this and we'll wrap it up for tonight. John chapter 6. John 6 is an interesting chapter. It's a long chapter, but it's a very interesting chapter. John 6. Jesus said, Jesus has told them in verse 50 and 50, well, verse 51, he said, I'm the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I give for the life of the world. And the Jews therefore strove among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man, and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. Whoso eateth my flesh, and drinketh my blood, hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. And he that eateth my flesh, and drinketh my blood, dwelleth in me, and I in him. As the living Father has sent me, and I live by the Father, so he that eateth me, even he shall live by me. This is that bread which came down from heaven. Not as your fathers did eat manna and are dead. He that eateth this bread shall live forever. These things said he in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. Many, therefore, of his disciples, when they heard this, said, This is a hard saying. Who can hear it? In other words, not just hear it. Who can understand it? I don't know about you. When you read that, what do you think? You read that and think, what? I mean, I mean, is the Catholics right? We're eating the blood and the flesh of Jesus? Hmm? Is that what he's talking about? I don't know if the disciples looked at each other and said, oh man, not the, not the flesh and blood thing again. Hope he doesn't tell them that. That never goes over big, you know? That always gets people upset. And it did. Notice, many of His disciples, many people were following Him. Verse 61, Jesus knew in Himself that His disciples murmured at it. He said unto them, Doth this offend you? What and if ye shall see the Son of Man ascend up to where He was before? Hey, that's offensive. How about if I just ascend back to heaven and you see Me go? <gasps> Now he's going to tell you the key. The key to understanding John 6 is verse 63. Okay, you're listening? It is the Spirit that quickeneth, or that makes alive. The flesh profiteth nothing. The words I speak unto you, they are what? Spirit, and they are life. That means, these words I'm telling you, you don't take them literally. You take them spiritually. They are spirit and they are life. Now, but there are some of you that believe not. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believed not and who should betray Him. He, he knew there were people following Him, but they weren't really believers. And of course, He knew Judas would be the betrayer. And he said, Therefore said unto you, that no man can come unto me except it were given him my Father. Look at verse 66. From that time, 
a few of his disciples went back. Oh no, it doesn't say few, does it? It doesn't say some, does it? What does it say, church? Many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. Here's a great crowd. Jesus lays out what, what is a hard saying that, that really you have, to, uh, you, the, the, you have to have the Spirit of God to understand what He's talking about. See, He knew who's following Him but didn't believe in Him. And He's going to weed out the crowd. And they don't walk with Him anymore. There are some folks who want to follow Jesus and they want to, they, they want to be a disciple of Jesus until Jesus gives them something hard to do. And they don't come right out and say, "Why? Well, it's too tough. I don't want to. I wouldn't sign up for this." Huh? No, they say, "Well, I'm not comfortable with that. I just don't. I just don't feel comfortable doing something like that." You see, and and how many of you were in the in in the service, Army, Navy, ever some branch of the service? Let me see that. You were Marines, weren't you? You, you were Army. You were Army. You were Marine, Brother Bob, right? You guys all had, had sergeants. Hmm? Do you think, you think you go to your commanding officer, your sergeant even, and say, I'm not real comfortable doing that, Sarge? Hmm? Yeah, they all laugh. Huh? You know what? When you signed up, you signed up. You know, what, you know what you admire and what we learn from these disciples? The durability of their faith. The durability of their faith. So here they are, the twelve. It's grown. There's quite a few people following Jesus now. And, and maybe they're looking at each other thinking, alright man, this thing's really going to take off. we got a crowd now. And then Jesus gives the flesh and blood sermon. And now they go, oh boy, here we go. And they turned, they, it worked every time. They, they turned back, don't walk with them. Then Jesus, look at verse 67. Then Jesus said unto the twelve, Will you also go away? Will ye also go away? And Simon Peter answered, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life, and we believe and are sure that thou art that Christ, the Son of the living God. What a great confession by Peter. I love the durability of his faith. Others had seen his miracles. They heard his teaching. And yet when it came to doing something difficult, they said, no, nope, no more for me. I quit. I'm not following him anymore. <laughs> but not the twelve. The twelve said, we're staying no matter what. We're with you all the way, Lord. And they were. These, these men had a great durability of faith. I admire their stickability. In fact, these men, especially these last three men, whose Scripture says very little about, last Scripture and we'll be done. Look at Hebrews 11. They stayed true to Jesus, filled with the Spirit, and were greatly used by God. They too had durability of faith. Not just Peter and James and John. All the biggies. But the ones at 9, 10, and 11 slots, they were faithful to. They, were, they had durability of faith also. <clears throat> In Hebrews 11, you have, again, the listing of the Hall of Faith. And, you know, it, it goes from uh, Abel uh, to Enoch to Noah, and then down to Abraham, and of course Moses, and all the, all the biggies that you know. And verse 32, What more shall I say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon, and of Barak, and of Samson, and of Jephthah, of David also, and Samuel, and of the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, 
Quench the violence of fire. Escape the edge of the sword. Out of weakness were made strong. Wax valiant in fight. Turn to flight the armies of aliens. Women received their dead, raised to life again. Others were tortured, not accepting deliverance that they might obtain a better resurrection. Others had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings. Yea, moreover of bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn asunder. They were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented. Oh, then there's a parenthesis. What's a parenthesis, church? It's a personal note from the author to the reader. God tells us something personal here. You know what God tells us? Of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. And these all having a, obtained a good report through faith received not the promise. God having provided some better thing for us that they without us should not be made perfect. God says these are men and women who are unnamed. We don't know who they were. The world didn't recognize them. The world wasn't, they weren't known to the world. And the world doesn't remember them or know anything about them. But in eternity, they'll receive a full and a just reward. Maybe that's what Jesus meant when He said, the last will be first and the first will be last. God uses perfectly ordinary people to do extraordinary things. That's what we learn from these three guys. They didn't get a lot of attention, didn't get a lot of spotlight. Just faithful and devoted followers of Jesus Christ. Let's stand together for prayer, shall we? Father, thank You for this evening. Thank You for these men and their faithfulness to You and their loyalty and their devotion to You. Help us to do that. Lord, even though, Lord, the, the, the greatness, their durability of faith, their faithfulness to You and their zeal for You, their compassion, their desire to preach the Gospel, even though they were in relative obscurity. But it's been nearly 2,000 years. It's been over 2,000 years since they walked the earth. And we're talking about them tonight. be quite a, quite a joy in heaven to meet these men. To talk with them. And yet, Lord, I pray that we'll not hang our head in embarrassment because of how little we've done for the cause of Christ. How much we got caught up into the things of the world instead of having a zeal for God. Give us that zeal that these men have. Give us that durability of faith that they had. That we could receive a full reward when we see You face to face. Thank You for loving us. Thank You, Lord, for Your Word. Dismiss us now with Your care. I pray, God, that You make us mindful of Your presence as we leave this place tonight. It's in Jesus' name we ask it. Amen.